three men enter, one man leaves. Welcome to Thunderdome. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Infinite Windows, the greatest racing game in the world. C64 manual remastered. Competition Pro, competition no. All this and more on this week's bumper episode of This Week in Retro, as we'll uh, be taking a week off next week, so let's cram it all into this week. Enjoy an extra long show. Up-to-date news for out-of-date tech. I found a real Australian, Neil, a real one. Um, our special guest. A real this week. one. Yeah, a real one. <laughs> Seriously, I promise. This time it's a real one, not a fake one like myself. Um, our special guest this week, well, he's possibly one of the most active people on the subreddit, um, for one, but he's also a YouTuber under the channel name Oz Retrocomp. Welcome, Tony. G'day, Chris. G'day, Neil. Uh, thanks for having me. I think I first met you in Neil's Discord group, actually, um, but fast became a fan of your channel, uh, which at the time was specialising in price trends for retro kit, both globally and here in Australia, um, a topic I often fall short of when Neil keeps forgetting that I actually grew up in the UK and asked me what things cost back in the day. So maybe you can <laughs> fill in some of the gaps today. Uh, it's a topic that does come up a lot. Uh, so tell us about yourself, Tony. What brings you to the hobby? Oh, well, look, um, do you want the short version or do you want the, the long version? I should point out at this point as well, in, in classic Australian telecom style, we've got a bit of a delay on the line. So I know Duncan's going to do a great job of um, editing a, us up. But if, if there are a few jump cuts, please forgive us just to make things smoother for you. And um, Tony, I think you should definitely indulge us. I'd like the longer answer, please. Okay, well, I'll give you the short answer first, and that's midlife crisis. And then I'll give you the short, long answer. <laughs> which is I got hooked on gaming and computing when I was very young. Um, family friends had a TV with a built-in Pong game, and I used to love playing that when I was about four or five. So that was my first intro to gaming as such, which uh, led to us eventually getting um, our first console, which was a ColecoVision. And, um, yeah, apparently it actually quite worked, worked really well. It was actually like a joint present for my sister and I. So crazy part is we managed to make it work somehow but i don't think it's entirely coincidental that uh, next christmas i got a vic 20 all to myself so yeah the vic 20 was my first computer and uh, a few years after that i got a c64c um, a few christmases later it was the america's cup pack and um, it had a data set and it had four games including the america's cup game which is about as exciting as as it sounds to be honest um, after that i was able to get a 1541 drive and that's when things really kicked off on the computing side i really got into that pretty heavily and it was right up until probably about 92 that i was really using the c64 and then after i because by 92 i'd been working part-time after school in a big box store and saving my money and i bought myself my first real computer which was uh, 386 sx25 and i moved on to pc gaming uh, from there uh, mum bless her she helped me out by buying me a printer for that computer. So she reckoned it was going to help me with my education. Yeah, that's, you know, I guess, you know, make of that what you will. Um, now it's time for me to skip forward a couple of decades because this is the short, long version. Um, yeah, it was probably about five years ago. Uh, the algorithm start push, started to push tech mode onto me. And, um, of course, that led to various other YouTube channels being pushed onto me like the West life and LGR and the eight bit guy until eventually I came across this really great series um, with this it was about the restoration of an a 500 and it was some English bloke uh, with a beard and a very calm voice. And um, I don't know how I managed it, but somehow I'm here today. So yeah, that, that's, that's the short long version. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. It's funny how it seems to be Neil's video that brought us, brought us both into the hobby, actually. It's a, it's a bit weird. But anyway, um, so questions that we asked Dave, we'll use the same questions every time we have a guest on because um, it's interesting to compare. If you could pick only one, which system? Ooh. Yeah, only one? Okay. Um, I reckon the BBC Master 128. Ooh unexpected answer hmm. chris i didn't see that coming no, i didn't see that coming <laughs> yep all right 
Any reason for that? Oh, well, that, well I, I did say it was a short, long um, history. Uh, yeah, the, the BBC was the first computer that I really took seriously. It was what I, what I used when I was in high school, and it was my first... I would noodled about with a bit of coding in Commodore Basic that BBC Basic just blew me right away, and it was also my first opportunity to play with networking. And um, once you figure out how Star Remote works, and the rest of the class hasn't caught up to you, you can have a lot of fun with that. So um, make of that what you will. <laughs> nice. Okay. Right. Next question. Again, if you could have only one, which game? Oh, Elite, of course. You can't have a BBC Micro without Elite. It's it's not allowed. It's against the law, isn't it? <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Excellent answer. Okay, and final question to number three. Um, which joystick? That's oh, easy. TAC2, the greatest joystick ever in the history of joysticks. Oh, he's got a prop there. Nice. So the TAC2... Uh, I get you need some kind of adapter, I expect, to plug that into your BBC Master and then a game of Elite and you're set for a, an evening's gaming. Yeah, pretty much. Just, um, yeah, that's a typical Saturday night in my house. Ironic, Neil. We've got an Australian on and we're after Australian computer history and he want, he likes the BBC Micro, so it's still not helping, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, before we move into our stories, and I'm really looking forward to getting Tony's thoughts on this week's stories, I've got I've got a few pre-story bits here, which were raised by producer Duncan. Um, he mentioned before we started the show this week that on last week's show, we talked about the Tank Mouse Kickstarter. And uh, I should point out, I think it was at about 40 or 50% funded last week, and it's now hit the 100% funding target and beyond. So huge congratulations to that project. And um, this, if you didn't hear it, was the project the kickstarter to recreate the classic amiga tank mouse and um duncan's raised today that it's also been officially licensed which means that it can now legally use the amiga branding which raises the question for me why did they have to license it was the design patented did they use the amiga name without permission was it always the plan to seek licensing or was it an amicable decision or did they get their arm twisted when somebody got uncomfortable with them uh, using either patented designs or the Amiga name. I don't know. I'm just speculating here. So um, I'd like to know more about that because, as Duncan said to me, uh, it's a bit odd that this mouse is licensed and, as far as we know, the tank mouse that's included with the A500 Mini isn't. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, we know the A500 Mini mouse um, that we assumed would be full size according to the prototype that we've now seen, appears slightly smaller than a full-size tank mouse. And I do mean slightly smaller here. Maybe it's the design that requires a license, but I'd be surprised if that was the case. That said, um, one of my concerns when I saw this project first, em first emerge is that the tank mouse is the tank mouse, sorry, a protected design. Um, the thought did actually cross my mind. I'd suggest it's more likely because they want to use the name uh, more importantly, the, the brand Amiga. That's my guess. Um, the Mini has avoided use of that by simply being called the A500 Mini. Uh, the word Amiga is not on the product as far as I'm aware, thus saving the cost. They've licensed the ROMs, of course, or they couldn't sell it as a retail product and saying they've got the licensed games on it from release. So with the mouse, it's an interesting one. Um, why pay just so that you can use the name when it, it could be avoided in theory? So maybe this is a case of playing it safe, or maybe they couldn't refuse. They got an offer that they couldn't refuse for the licensing and permission to use it, or perhaps they just thought the profit margin is already that good that they may as well use it because it's nice to have. I don't know, but I, I think it is nice. Um, what isn't nice is some people now saying that they refuse to back it because they don't want their money going into the owners of the trademark. Um, and I suspect they weren't going to back it anyway. So it just becomes a, a, an excuse to sound off, which is a, yeah, a little bit unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are always those, those kinds of people about, but it's certainly something to watch out for because the world of Amiga lawsuits is... Uh, always entertaining at the very least, in, unless, of course, you're the subject of one of them. Um, but it sounds like the tank mouse won't be fooling foul, foul of the law or any agree licensing agreements or anything like that, which is good news for backers. And um, it's hit 100%. I understand if it hits 150% that everyone gets a free dongle included so that they can use it uh, wirelessly with their classic Amigas 
otherwise at this point you have to get a, a USB or a blue you've got to get some kind of adapter as it is so if they hit 150 percent, that deals with all of that and it will be included so um, good luck to them on hitting that target and uh, well done to everyone who's backed it it's just another example of the huge amount of support behind not just the amiga but retro computing as a whole so well done everyone now let's get into our stories what was the first version of windows you ever used guys for me, um, it was probably Windows 3.1.1 for work groups. Um, it came with my Packard Bell 486 PC, along with a bunch of stuff in Windows, media players and other trumpery. Uh, it, it came with a CD that ran in Windows, and it was called The Animals. I don't know if this will ring any bells with anyone. It was kind of like an animal encyclopedia, because in that first wave of multimedia titles that we got... Um, the, the first thing that kept getting pushed within, was encyclopedias, wasn't it? Just look at how much text we can get onto a, onto a CD. Isn't it amazing? And then videos started creeping into these things. And on this animal encyclopedia, what it included was like these postage, si postage stamp sized videos uh, all recorded at San Diego Zoo. Did anyone else have that? Do you guys, does that ring any bells? No, not for me. <laughs> No, <laughs> maybe it was no, just like it. a Packard Bell thing. It was part of their bundle. It included things like um, Mega Race uh, and various other CDs. Um, but yeah, Tony, what Windows did you have? What did you start out with? Oh, I actually didn't start with Windows until I went to college. I um, I started doing a, um, a trade certificate in electronics in 1993, and it was Windows 3.1 that we were using Oddly enough, as part of the course, uh, we had to do like basic business computing. So it was Windows 3.1 with Word and Excel, and that was pretty much my that was my introduction to to Windows. Um, how about yourself, Chris? Yeah, my my trusty Amstrad 386DX, which was my first PC, came with a legit install of Windows 3.0 um, and the original disks, which were actually branded Amstrad. They're proprietary disks, but it was Microsoft Windows 3 on them. Uh, but the kind man who sold the machine to me secondhand also gave me a dodgy copy of Windows 3.1, um, which, of course, I installed the very next day. Uh, and then... I've talked about it before. I do have this urge to keep things factory default. So I did actually have to fight the urge to wipe it again and put Windows 3.0 with those Amstrad disks back onto the machine. But I, I didn't. I resisted. Um, and I remember I, I resisted because Windows 3.1 felt so much better than Windows 3.0. I can't for the life of me remember why it was so much better. But back in the day, for some reason, I felt that it was. Do I have nostalgia for Windows 3.1, though? And it's funny, um, but that question often can't be answered until you actually try stepping back and seeing if the same experience gives you a smile again all these years later. Thanks to Reddit user I Got Zero Budget, I found out this week. Um, he posted a link to PCJS.org, otherwise known as PCJS Machines, run by Jeff Parsons. The site hosts PC emulators created in JavaScript so that they can run in a browser. Uh, it gives, and I quote, uh, an IBM PC experience using original ROMs, CPUs running at their original speeds, and early IBM video cards and monitors. The link given on the subreddit was directly to a virtual machine running Microsoft Windows 3.1 using an IBM PC80 running PC DOS 3.3. Specs of the emulated machine are an IBM PC AT running at 8 megahertz, 2 megabyte of RAM, and a 20 megabyte hard disk uh, IBM VGA. So not as capable as my uh, my Marty Amstrad, I must say. Um, I honestly think this was the first time I've actually played with Windows 3.1 since I moved to Windows 95 with my first Pentium. I can't say it made me pine for the good old days as much as, you know, playing Doom or playing X-Wing or something like that does. But it did put a smile on my face, which was unexpected. Um, of course, the first thing I did was jump into a game of Solitaire, Neil, because we talked about that the other week. Uh, and before I even started the deal of the game, I changed the deck and I changed it to the black murky castle with the bat in the background and all of that, just like I would have done back in the day. Which was, which was good fun. Um, and then I started the game and, of course, regretted choosing the default three-card flip instead of a one-card flip, which is, of course, much easier to win with. Um, went into paint. Well, paint's paint. I don't know if it's ever ch changed. Of course it has, but you know what I mean. Um, 
But it was the things that I've forgotten, though. Like navigating around's intuitive enough, but when I went to close a window, I did instinctively go to the top left, whereas these days we go to the top right, but I forgot that you have to double click. And if you don't double click, you have to use the drop down to choose close window. Completely forgotten about that. Um, have you guys had a play with this site? I have. It's funny you should say that, um, how instincts kick in. And actually, that one instinct that you've described never left me hmm. because I still double click top left on Windows 10. I'm, I haven't gone to 11 uh, and it will close the window or you click once and it brings up the menu. I still do that. I've never migrated to click in the cross at the top right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, So those instincts kick in. Uh, the thing that struck me about this website, which is is really cool to go and explore, it isn't just running everything as fast as it can. You are waiting for folders and the contents of folders to appear. You are getting a, a period authentic experience. Um, sometimes we've had websites like this in the past, which are kind of like Windows in a browser thing, go back and explore Windows 3 or Windows 95. And they're more simulators that, that you know, somebody's just re recreated the experience um, rather cleverly, cleverly using html or, or whatever it is they've used java or something like that but this is actually a full-blown emulator running in this website so you get an authentic experience um for some reason uh, the first thing that i wanted to do and i did was i went to the file explorer uh, i went into the windows directory and i looked for the wav files to play some audio i don't know why that's just the first thing i did and i found there was no sound device so i couldn't actually play them oh. <laughs> i just i just got to see the waveforms but it wouldn't play them um so yeah and then i just went and played some minesweeper uh and i even dropped out of windows back down into dos just to have a poke around and see what was going on and um yeah it was good fun and and i also found i wasn't expecting this there's a whole bunch of other configurations on the website so i ended up um, in something called Windows 386 from 1987. I've not come across that one before. Mm. I think it's just sort of a, a tweaked version of Windows 2 for 386 processors, something like that. So um, that was interesting. But I find that as soon as you go earlier than Windows 3, what you're looking at is more like a, a, a DOS ASCII interface, I guess. it's not. It doesn't really work in the way that Windows 3 does. Um, the graphics are, are just enhanced immeasurably when you get to Windows 3 compared to those earlier versions. So I tend to get very bored very quickly in those earlier ones. And, and nostalgia probably plays a big part in that as well. It's just not familiar to me. But Windows 3, yeah, I can have lots of fun in that. Um, how about you, Tony? Did this website raise your pulse? Yes, Neil. i I got to say, I had heaps of fun with this site. And I just... Not, not just the Windows stuff. Um, there's so many other emulators to choose from. There, there's CPM. There was a bunch of even old arcade games like Space Invaders and, and things like that. So really, uh, Jeff Parsons has done a fantastic job putting these all together. But i got to admit, I didn't do much with those other emulators because my first thing I just wanted to do was to get into Windows 3.1 and change the colour scheme to Hot Dog Stand. And the reason for that is because it reminds me of my first full-time job um, when I was working in the back office for a major, uh, one of the major banks here in, in Australia. And uh, obviously people back in the mid nineties weren't quite as vigilant with um, cyber security as they are now. So what happened, and this wasn't me that was doing this, but what one of my colleagues would do very helpfully is when somebody went away from their computer without locking the screen, they would go and change the color scheme of the person's computer to hot dog stand sort of as their way of saying, Hey, look, you shouldn't be walking. You should be locking your computer before you walk away. Um, I don't think it was entirely altruistic though, because this chap also had a habit of some other <laughs> interesting pranks that I, um, I think we've all been on the receiving end of, um, uh, such as, um, you know, when you have a telephone and you had the old ones, which had the receiver with the cable that would go into the actual phone itself and he'd loosen it just a bit. So when you rip the receiver off, it's like, Ooh, there goes the, you know, there, there goes the cable and you're just talking into nothing for a few seconds. Um, really embarrassing when you're talking to um, a, a client. But anyway, that's, um, that, that, that's I, I digress. Um, but yeah, his favorite trick was um, to do with stealing mouse balls and hiding them all around the office. So, you know, your mouse ball would get stolen and then you'd find it in a, in a pot plant or, or, or a desk drawer or something. And uh, that later evolved to when ball mice moved out and we started getting the optical mouse that uh, evolved into putting sticky tape over the 
uh, over the sensor because that would have the same result. And in fact, there was one time where, where one of my colleagues had had that happen to them and they called IT and the IT guy came out and uh, he was absolutely flummoxed for 15 minutes. He had no idea what was going on. In fact, he was just about to uh, put a new mouse on that particular computer when um, the perpetrator helpfully said, oh, um, do you want to have a look under the under the mice, under the mouse mouse makes? I know mine sometimes gets a bit uh, dirty underneath and yet lo and behold, um, yeah, they eventually found the sticky tape. So, so yeah, that was, um, it just shows just my level of maturity and, you know, sorry for dragging this horribly off topic, Neil. <laughs> that's okay. Um, just remind us, hot dog stand, I believe is the one that's just all, all the reds and all the yellows, all the windows are red and the backgrounds are yellow. That's the one, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct. It's, um, it's, it, it's, It'll basically just um, completely ruin your retinas if you're not expecting it. It's, it's quite <laughs> confronting. <laughs> Brilliant. No. Um, yeah, but no, don't worry about going off topic, Tony. That's that's we might as well be called this week off topic. That's that's how we do things around here. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, there's, there's a whole other topic brewing. I think oh, new IT pranks. Um, <laughs> we, we'd be here all day, so we might better not do that one this week. Um, anyway, thanks to I have zero budget, and also to Jeff Parsons for the, for his work on this site. Not everyone has room for every PC that we'd like to have a tinker with. So this kind of thing really does offer a great alternative for a quick fix. There are plenty of other setups on the site, so please do check it out. So our next story, Chris, I noticed was shared by a familiar name. Would you like to confess? Yeah, it might have been me, but it it was too good to resist. (laughs) It is a good story and it was upvoted, so uh, the people wanted to hear about it. But um, it's a story about Top Gear. Yes, that Top Gear. It's reviewed something on its website that we may be familiar with. Uh, Not the latest Ferrari. And are you ready for an Aussie reference here, lads? I hope you are. It's not the latest V8 Holden. (gasps) That is, that's Australian. Well, there isn't a latest V8 Holden. That's why. (laughs) Oh, is that out of business? (laughs) Anyway, carry on. (laughs) What happened to Holden? (laughs) When when were they last around? Uh, 2020. 2020. Okay. So around about 2020, we lost Holden. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. I always remember them as being the the company that their car appeared on Top Gear here in the UK, as we're talking about Top Gear. And there, it was essentially what we know as a Vauxhall Astra or an Opel Astra with a massive honking great V8 strapped to it and some sports suspension. That's, 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 I'm sure they have much more history to their company, but that's how I knew it. But what we had on the um, Top Gear website was none of that. It was a retrospective of Lotus Esprit Turbo Challenge, um, a little victory for retro in the mainstream. And it's all thanks to the author Mike Channel, who writes for the website. Now, this article, I have to say, isn't super detailed. We'll probably spend more words on it talking about it here and now than are actually written down on the website. But it's a lot of fun to see it on the Top Gear website. Uh, In it, there's a reference to OutRun in there. It mentions the sequels spawned by the success of the game. And it also mentions the fact that in the first game, you may remember, in fact, I think you've got it behind you for those watching. Chris has got it on his big screen. And you'll notice in the bottom half, in the top half of the screen, you've got the game. This is Lotus 1. In the bottom half of the screen, you've got a picture of the the Lotus side on with a couple of mechanics. I think they're animated as well. Those mechanics just sort of waving a spanner about and scratching their heads. Uh, And in the article, he goes on to say this is perhaps the most accurate representation of Lotus ownership that you'll see, your car in a garage. Slightly (laughs) harsh, but uh, (laughs) did it make you smile to see this article, Chris? Oh, absolutely, Neil. Seriously, this is my world's colliding. Um, As I know you're aware, my other passion is cars, and I adore Top Gear. Well, I did adore adore Top Gear. Um, We won't won't go there. I did adore Top Gear at one point. but to see a story on the Top Gear website about my one of my favourite Amiga games, uh, it's just amazing, Neil. And I'm actually glad that they picked Lotus 1 and even made comment about how some of it was, in quotes, realistic. Um, yes, Top Gear described Lotus 1, an Amiga game, as realistic. For the time, of course. Um, but it was. Yes. you know, Most sprite-based games or arcade racers back then, the sprite-based ones specifically, if you had gears at all, for example, you had a choice of high gear or low gear. That's all you had. And Lotus turns up with its amazing frame rate and a 5 speed gearbox and the need to manage your fuel and race position to secure victory by way of pit stops. Um, I can't think of anything else that was at quite that level at the time. 
I do recall clearly half the screen uh, uh, play field, if you're in single player, uh, the bottom half, as you've already said, was taken up with the side view of the Lotus, um, which is a lovely thing to look at anyway. Uh, I mean, I've, that part of that was the trick of making the frame rate as high as they did as well, because you've only got half the screen as your play field, you know, most of the time. Although in two player, obviously you're using pretty much the, the full screen. What I also recall, though, is how hard the game was to beat on hard, as in the hardest difficulty setting, with manual gears. And in fact, if you did, and time for my first prop of the day for those watching on YouTube, in the manual, and I've got a bookmark here, um, there's actually a form to fill in, because if you beat it, and you had to beat it on hard with manual gears, and then the game would actually award you with two codes, and so what it asks you for here is basically your computer format and then your first number and then the second number. So it would give you two sets of codes. Then obviously you fill in your name and address and you are awarded with a Lotus license. And yes, that's something I did back in the day. <laughs> I kept going. Tell me you've still got until it. I, no, do you know what? The, the, there's only a small hope that maybe it's among some old schoolwork in my parents' loft. And so next trip back to the UK, I, I need to rummage through the loft anyway. There's a very slim, slim, slim chance. But basically all that arrived, just, um, my Lotus license, all yeah. it was was a, p a printed piece of A4 paper. <laughs> I, I remember I the day. Say, can you just describe it to us? Yeah, yeah, that, it, that's it. Was it color? Was it black and white? <laughs> it was just that's black it. and white. Okay. And there was like, a, you know, that sort of cliche sort of rectangle you know bold outline with some words in the middle i can't remember exactly what it looked like the logo would have been in there at some point my name was on there i can't even remember my name may have even been handwritten on after this thing was printed out i can't actually remember i do remember clearly because it took me this is how hard the game was i was hammering it trying to beat it over and over again then Lotus 2 came out when Lotus 2 came out which i'm pretty sure was a year after i still hadn't completed Lotus 1 Completed Lotus 2 in a week because I found that incredibly easy in, in comparison. Went back to Lotus 1 and then just kept going until I beat it. And then I had to ring the number on the back of the box, which is still here, and check that they were still awarding this damn license. <laughs> sure enough, they were. Yeah. And I was very excited and sent off for it. But yeah, I got my Lotus license. Um, but anyway, it's interesting to see a game like this turn up on a site like Top Gear, don't you think, Neil? Yeah, so that would have cost them some money to send you that certificate. So th that would have been offset by the um, assumption that you'd paid for the game. And, and assume, presumably you'd only apply for it if you had the manual and you'd seen those details. So hopefully they weren't sending out a load of certificates <laughs> to pirates. Um, I'm sure they weren't. But um, yeah, and the big thing about Lotus 2 when that came along was, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was full screen, wasn't mm. it? They, you lost the half screen. And you had full screen and it still kept that incredible speed. The only other game I can think that is, was a bit like how you described 2D based, but with a bit, a bit of realism thrown in was probably Vroom. Did you ever play Vroom? Oh. It was kind of 2D. It did have some sort of 3D elements to it. And it was Formula One based. Mm, yeah, and no, I know you your F1 games. I, I, I think I played it briefly. It's not one I've played over. Uh, I'm, I'm now thinking of Nigel Mansell's F1, which is another one, I guess. But that, they came, that came after Lotus, though, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, but Lotus really stood out as the one that said, um, hey, do you remember that really awful version of OutRun that we had on, on the Amiga and on the Atari ST as well? It was terrible on there. Um, by the way, we can actually do these super scalar sprite racing, you know, games uh, on these 16-bit systems, and this is how you do it. And it did it with a huge amount of class and style. And of course, the Lotus was such a desirable car. Mm. Um, the, in the Top Gear article, he looks back and describes it as, I think, a plastic Ferrari or something like that. He's not. He's not particularly complimentary about it, but it'll always have a place in my heart. Those those old Lotus cars um and of course it's just nice to see retro get some attention in the mainstream because top gear is undoubtedly the mainstream and it reminds me of back in the day um and this hasn't really changed much of just how excited i would get if i saw computing appear in the mainstream we've talked about old tv shows and, and movies and things like that in the past just to get a glimpse of uh, acknowledgement of something that you were into whether it was your amstrad or your atari st or whatever it was reflected on mainstream media it would give you a buzz 
maybe it was just me but i was really excited that it's like oh yeah okay the world acknowledges my little hobby exists uh, and of course it wasn't a little hobby it was just largely ignored by whoever made mainstream media and um gaming not so much uh, in the modern day it is of course a huge multi-billion dollar business which is accepted in the mainstream but now um now I think I get the same feelings when I see retro acknowledged. <laughs> it's just nice to see it happen. And I, and I got that when I saw the Top Gear article. It was like a small victory for us retro gamers. So I thought that was really nice. Um, so, you know, but but that's understandable in the modern day because I guess by its very nature, retro would be, it would be hard for it to become mainstream because its audience generally has to be nostalgic for it. So, yeah, I don't know. What, what do you think, Tony? Will retro always be considered a bit sort of fusty and a bit odd to the mainstream and for us oldies um or, or could retro ever be mainstream what do you think tony it's a big question yeah that's a that's a great question neil um i tend to think of retro gaming and vintage computing as sort of a almost a, a gen x version of classic cars in that you know, classic cars, you know, to our to our grandparents and our parents, classic cars seem to evoke something in them like with nostalgia and, and whatnot, whereas people our age um, seem to be getting a bit of the fizz of that nature from from retro gaming and vintage computing and, and classic cars too, for that matter. But I think that I think that that's probably a fairly good sort of um, equivalent. Um, as for the mainstream side of things, um, I think retro gaming may potentially become a bit more mainstream as the barriers to entry keep reducing. Um, you know, the various plug-and-play emulation type mini consoles have made it a lot simpler for people to do some form of retro gaming. And, and as new consoles come out with, you know, classic game packs and all that sort of stuff, again, you know, the actual gaming side of it is is fairly... It's never been easier to get into retro gaming, but I think the, uh, I think the vintage computing will always be a bit niche, but... Um, it's interesting that really with the, uh, as, as far as vintage computers and uh, classic cars go, there really seems to be a, a big crossover between people that are into that sort of, into those sorts of um, interests. Because I, I guess a classic example is Nostalgia Nerd and his Renault 19, which, uh, well, that's over 30 <laughs> years old now, so that's a classic car. Um, you know, and I can eventually see many classic car shows around the place, potentially um, not just having the cars, but also having maybe like a small, um, hands-on arcadey kind of computer game area where, you, where it might be full of things like, um, say, Daytona, um, everything from Daytona cabinets to, to the Commodore 64 with paddles playing Le Mans, you know, just to show the evolution of how um, cars and, and racing has been represented in gaming over the years because I think there'd be a lot of crossover there. But but getting into the more niche things, and I've been to shows where they've also had stationary engines and we're talking like real niche um, really niche car shows. We're talking like British car shows where there's guys that are Morris dancing and all this sort of stuff. Um, the last one of those I went to, they had a, 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 an array of static engines. And I'm thinking, you know, an array of vintage computers next to the array of static engines, I think would kind of appeal to the similar sort of the extremities of, 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 of those particular interests. Um, what do you reckon, Chris? Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think that would be a fantastic idea, actually, to have like an expo that sort of merges the two and maybe other retro stuff as well. I'm kind of kicking myself. Yeah, when, when, if, when, I, if I can jump in there, yeah. sorry, Chris. Um, I'm just thinking back to recent, well, a couple of years back, three years now. God, I've got to account for uh, the Great Plague and what happened before it. Um, mm. And before that, uh, I went to the Goodwood Festival of, no, the Goodwood Revival which is where all the classic cars get together and the, the very rich people race around the track and, and everyone sort of almost cosplays, dresses up in 40s, 50s, whatever era of car they've bought with them or, and are into. And um, yeah, I can just see what, what Tony suggested there. If you could have next to all the 1980s hot hatches, uh, an arcade full of outruns and, you know, all the other racing games, maybe some 90s mm. games as well. Next year, Lancia Integrale, you've got Sega Rally. That would be awesome. I think there would be an audience for that. Um, but on the flip side, when I was there, I went into the Caterham tent. Um, Caterham do uh, a, a little sort of Lotus 7 based car, and they had a, a VR helmet, and you could mm. put that on and look at their latest model in 3D and walk around it in VR. So they really do embrace technology, wow, new technology, but I think. There would be a, a huge audience at that kind of thing. Apart from the 1940s and 50s people, they can go and watch mm. the big band and dance to swing or whatever they're doing. The 80s with the hot hatches, definitely a market <laughs> for it, I think. 
Yeah, I, th- I think it'd be really cool. You could even do it the, the, the uh, flip it the other way, and if you've got a computer expo, a retro computer expo, get a couple of classic cars to sit in the middle. You know that are relevant to the period. That would be cool as well. well that's where I'm kind of kicking myself when you mentioned um, nostalgia as Renault 19. I've had my 1989 cars. I had um, in fairly recent history a Nissan 180SX, which from 1989, and a Nissan 300ZX, also from 1989. And now I don't have an 80s car. And I want one. And when I look at the prices, they're way past what I would want to spend on either of them. Um, but anyway, what I do know is uh, to, on that topic, we've definitely chosen the cheaper hobby, even if you take into account the crazy prices of Amiga 1200s. Um, I, in fact, I still lose, I have to share this story, I still lose sleep over the fact that when they hit rock bottom, I could have picked up my all-time dream car, mainly because it was in Outrun, a Ferrari Testarossa, and I'm not even joking. It would have been tight. Uh, it would have required a loan. Don't for one moment think I've made of, made of money or anything. <laughs> but they did seriously hit rock bottom. Um, and relatively speaking, they became, and I use this word very loosely, affordable um, for a brief time. And now, along with everything else, 80s, they've just shot right up and they are way out of reach. I don't even look at the prices anymore because there's no point teasing myself. Mm. Um, and in fact, going back to the Lotus, um, and you're right, Neil, in the, the uh, article does refer to it as essentially England's Lotus, uh, England's Ferrari Testarossa, sorry. Um, but I found myself wondering this week what the Lotus Esprit may be worth. Over here in Australia, now they're harder to get over here, so I will throw that in. Um, but... What they'll be talking about here is the the twin turbo V8 version. All I could find for sale over here is the four cylinder turbo version, which really is the baby version of the Esprit, and they've jumped up from being quite attainable to being eighty five thousand dollars Australian. That's the cheapest I could find one. It was a beautiful looking red one, and the only other one I could find, which was also the baby version, was a hundred and nine thousand dollars Australian. So. You know, the 80s and 90s are hot right now. That's great for collectors and investors. Not so great for us just trying to relive the past. Um, Do you agree, Neil? Uh, Does nostalgia, do you think, does that window apply to everything from the time period? You're listening to This Week in Classic Cars. (laughs) Um, Chris, uh, 109,000 Australian dollars. What what does that translate to in in pounds? Do the maths for me, Neil. (laughs) Have it. Okay. (laughs) Okay, Half so about fifty five thousand pounds, yeah. something like that. It's a lot of money for something that is going to need maintenance and and everything else on top of it. So um, yeah, but uh, it's still more affordable than a Ferrari. But oh my good goodness, a Testarossa! I would be kicking myself too. I, can you remember how much that Testarossa was going for? Oh, look, there was one for eighty five thousand. There were ones um, that we laughed at. A a friend of mine at work and myself, we still prod ourselves and remind ourselves what idiots we were. We were laughing at people on Gumtree that were selling them for 69,000 because we were going, huh, this idiot wants 69,000 for a left-hand drive version. (laughs) I could have had one, Neil. I could have had one. Oh, Anyway, well, we can say that about anything, really, can't we? Whether it's a, a Ferrari or, a, a, you know, an Apple One, uh, whatever. Mm. Hindsight is 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 a cruel mistress. But um, th- there we go. Maybe one day, and if you listener would like to become a patron of the show, you can help Chris to realise his dream. We just need about twenty thousand of you to sign up, and <laughs> we can get him over the line. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, in terms of uh, nostalgia, eighties and nineties. Um, I mean, just on reflection, there are now three new magazines that have appeared in the high street here. There's Amiga Addict and Pixel Addict have recently um, gone to W8 Smith, so they're actually realizing their dream of appearing on the high street, as is Fusion Magazine. They've got themselves on the high street and they'll sit alongside what, what I guess is the retro crown holder for retro gamers, which is Retro Gamer Magazine, been around for decades now. So, um, yeah, but also if you think about it, the very act of going to the high street to buy a magazine could be for considered by some to be retro in itself now i mean here's a question for you uh, both of you we'll start with chris w- when did you last walk to a shop browse the magazines take one off the rack and go and buy it at the counter 
Can you remember? Yeah, no, yeah, it's a good question. But just the other week, in fact, while I was happened to be in the supermarket, I made the point, as I usually do, of going to the magazine rack, just to have a quick scan of the magazines and to see if there's a copy of Retro Gamer. There never is. Um, and, and if I happen to be in in a um, news agent, I'll do the same thing. But usually, I'm just in there to buy a lottery ticket, to be honest. Um, but I'll have a quick glance. It wasn't long ago, though, um, in fact, 2019, you know, before the event. Um, but if I was traveling, if I was at an airport, whether it was for work or for personal business, it was part of my my travel habit to go into the news agent at the airport and buy a magazine or two for the trip. Didn't matter. It could be an hour's flight. It could be a 16-hour flight. I needed a magazine in my hand for that flight. Um, so, yeah, that habit stays with me. But it is, like you say, the very act of buying a magazine in the shop is kind of retro in itself. Uh, but they're still on the shelf, so people must still be buying them. Uh, what about you, Tony? Hmm. Uh, oh, God. Um, oh God. <laughs> it's actually really embarrassing. I um, I don't remember the last time I went to a news agent, so I couldn't tell you the last time I bought a mag. Um, um, uh, Neil, <laughs> um, help me out here, mate. <laughs> well, that's kind of the answer I was expecting, if I'm honest, and I think... Uh, an airport, I agree with you. Those are kind of exceptional circumstances. I would I would normally pick up a magazine, whether it's retro, whether it's, I don't know, New Scientist, whatever, just to read on the airplane. I'd normally pick up something that I wouldn't normally buy, just, I don't know, to, 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 to dip into on a plane. Um, but that's a complete contrast to what I used to do, which was make a trip to town specifically to buy mm. a, a, a computer magazine. You know, I've not done that for decades. So, um, yeah, anyway, interesting thoughts on uh, the, the state of retro in the mainstream. And just to bring us back to the original story, that Top Gear story, the links are in the show notes if you want to go and have a read. And um, I don't know, maybe give them a prod, maybe encourage Top Gear to cover more uh, racing games in the future. I'd love to see them follow up on, on some more of them. And, um, yeah, help to push it into the mainstream. Retro is um it's going to take over mainstream gaming any day now. How are your manuals, lads? Um, do you collect the original manuals for your machines? Uh, what what kind of condition are they in? I love a manual. I love a manual, and I know you do too because you know we're, we're both big flight sim fans, and and that's part and parcel of a flight sim is a massive manual. So you've got to have your manuals. Um, I have in the cave. Uh, by, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw an advert in here now. I know this is completely <laughs> unexpected, but I'm gonna use my my privilege as a show host just to throw an advert in here. We've got the first public day for the cave this weekend. Ooh. Tickets are now on sale. If you want to come and visit the cave, rmcretro.com. Click on visit the cave, and you can come and um, spend half a day or a day here playing on all the machines. And you can go to the library, which is where I keep all my manuals and all my magazines. And my favorite ones in the library over there are the ring bound manuals. So much so that I'm putting an exhibition guide together for visitors that will be ring bound and kind of in the style of a, an old computer manual like the C64 or the Amstrad CPC, those, those ones that you would have got with your machine. So I really like those. And um, I guess the most recent example of a, a computer manual that I've used, if we're talking about computers specifically, was the Apple IIe a machine I'd never used before. I started restoring it here on the channel. So I, I used that and I, I had to grab that manual specifically to work out how to navigate the dual disk drives because I could access one, but it was a case of, well, how do I how do I talk to the second disk drive? I, I want to use that one and test that works. So pulled out the manual and found the information very quickly. It was very well written. And it just reminded me that of all the systems I've bought, in the past, the manuals have always been very, very good, um, which is probably a surprising thing because a lot of these old machines, th they were made on a very tight time schedule. They had to get them out to market and you would just assume the, the manuals would be perhaps rushed and an afterthought. But th so many of them are, are just brilliant. And this Apple IIe one was was um, no different. It was very well written. And I would go so far to say there is there is an art to making a good technical manual and I've got some really nice examples here, so I, I love them. Tony, how about you? Ah, oh, well, Neil, the only original manuals that I have for my machines are the ones that I've got with my consoles. So the uh, the Sega Mega Drive and uh, the PS2, 
Um, the Mega Drive one is near mint, and the one in the PS2 I haven't even taken out of the original wrapped plastic because I figured, oh, how hard can it be? And 20 years later, yeah, I still haven't had cause to use that. But um, with my vintage computers, as I've been recollecting them, um, I haven't <laughs> had much luck. The only only computer I've bought which had any form of manual at all was my Atari ST, and it came with a really dodgy copy of the Cubase manual. Um, it, it was it was obviously photocopied, and it had that really horrible plasticky comb binding, putting uh, sort of holding it all together. But um, yeah, other than that, I haven't really had real success with used manuals. Um, how about yourself, Chris? Yeah, I've mostly been lucky with the machines that I've collected. Uh, my A500 was a complete Batman pack, um, so that has all the manuals and paperwork. Um, again, prop time, but these are in beautiful condition and in fact jump to the ring binder one which is probably the one that looks the the most ropey just because of the nature of the ring bound booklet but once you get inside it's just really vivid bright colors looks like it's never been used or touched so i was very lucky there um the plus three that came just in the polys with this manual so for those listening it's it's, it's in okay con- condition but the page is just a little bit discolored and sort of some curling of the edges definitely not in as new condition um and then the ones that came with my acorn electron which was completely unboxed again ring bound looking a bit ropey but yeah that, that's probably the most discolored it just looks like even the the white of the pages has faded a little bit but it's still there it's still good a bit of turning up at the, uh, the corners um but um, interestingly the 48k spectrum that i was gifted which i have mentioned before i wasn't expecting the manuals at all because this was just a mate um godfrey um gave me the spectrum and completely unexpectedly he also pulled out the manual so i got both manuals there and they're actually in pretty good condition as well so that was really good and actually i do just want to make mention here of godfrey who i have mentioned before um uh, he's just an amazingly uh helpful and generous guy uh that um, was really well regarded, a uh, member of the Perth Amiga users group. Um, he insisted um, I have um, a hard to get Samsung keyboard membrane when my Amiga first had some issues, my Amiga 500. Wouldn't take any money for it, but I gave him some beers anyway. Just that just that kind of guy, you know. Um, and one of the first to help me whenever, whenever I had issues with some stuff. Stuff he's sold me that I've paid for, it's always been on mate's rates, including the um, A1200 that I have right here. Um, and as mentioned, he gifted me the 48K uh, and he gave it to me because he'd seen a comment I made on the Facebook group where I'd mentioned the fact that I always wanted one back in the day but never got one. And so he just hit me up, private messaged me and said, mate, you can have one. And he actually said to me, because I don't like taking stuff off people, he said, look, I got it for free, so you can have it for free. It's no problem. Of course, when I picked it up, he then proceeds to tell me that it's got a brand new membrane in it. It's had the composite mod done. He gives me the manuals. Uh, yada 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 you know it's a really good condition machine and i've later since found out that actually he paid another member for it he didn't get it for free at all he just wanted to gift it to me i knew i wouldn't take it unless he told me that story um so just a a really really great guy so i just want to say yep um thanks to godfrey and and also he never he never really made it to the Perth Amiga users group meets either um, because he's always been at home looking after his elderly mother it sounds like a cliche story but that's the kind of guy I'm talking about here. Anyway, back to the manuals. Just wanted to take time to thank Godfrey. Um, but back to the manuals. Um, the only ones I've had to collect separately are these ones here for the A1200, just because well, it's now the only machine that I've got that doesn't have the manuals. So that was sort of eating away at me. Well, now I need the manuals. So I got these um, from Marvin Drugsmer for one of the Facebook groups. Um, I think he runs an online store, Retro 8-Bit Shop. Dot com but he sold these to me for 20 euros now um you know if you look on ebay you can pay that just Chris, for one I'll book. just jump in not <clears throat> just jump in on amiga manuals because there's one that always makes me laugh and i don't know if you've got it there mm. but for whatever reason i seem to have about 30 copies of this manual it, it's thrown in with every single amiga that's donated or i find it in game boxes i find it everywhere and it's the a520 tv modulator manual <laughs> it's everywhere and i bet you've got a copy <laughs> maybe not with the a1200 it was with the 500 hang on but um <laughs> he's looking for it there there it is <laughs> I, i've got so many of them <laughs> they, they, they just seem to breed yeah i've got all the pamphlets for the a500 there that that was completely complete in fact the only thing that's dodgy out of the a500 collection is the the 
the um the envelope that the paperwork came in that's munted but everything mm. else is in good condition but yeah so this is the only set i've had to rebuy this a1200 um set i've actually been really really fortunate yeah i I mean not everybody is quite so lucky often manuals are missing or in very poor condition and um you know even some of my game manuals that i've got within in the boxes that they often suffer from foxing which is you get those sort of red dots emerging on the pages rusted staples that's the thing to look out for in the middle and often they're they're slightly a sort of a dodgy damp paper smell that always sort of puts me off opening them up uh, and ebay prices are, as i just mentioned they can be pretty crazy just for manuals and, and often they're in average condition as well um of course many manuals are now available online on archive.org and that's a really good source for these thankfully if you if you're chasing a manual but of course they're often just scanned versions of the paper-based one so the, the the quality of the scan can be a bit questionable it's not always easy to read and it's certainly not searchable and it's not really the kind of quality that you want to print off a lot of the time either so the story um is about a blogger called pickled light uh, and he seems to have come to the rescue at least for c64 owners I told you I had to give them from uh, some love after last week, Neil, when I said the Spectrum was more worth celebrating for its 40th birthday than the C64. <laughs> I'm redeeming myself, okay, guys? So anyway, yeah. So his his blog, first of all, is full of useful stuff to do with the C64. Um, he's got some project stuff on there, and he always includes photos and prices of what these projects cost, restorations, that kind of thing. Really worth looking at just for that. But he's also posted on there PDF versions of the C64 manuals, not scanned, fully retyped and updated. Um, and this news was shared with us by, who was it? It was Oz Retrocomp. <laughs> so, Tony, <laughs> do you want to expand on what you liked about this project? I'd love to, Chris, but just prior to that, on behalf of every C64 owner that's ever been a C64 owner, I forgive you, apology accepted. You've redeemed yourself. Well done, son. <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile back on topic i brought this to the subreddit's attention because i i personally think this is a fantastic project and there are probably viewers out there who or, or listeners out there that um would like to or get their hands on a on a c64 manual or may may even currently have one that's a bit ratty and they just want a nice shiny fresh one and obviously to be able to not just have a PDF, but also to be able to print it is also a really, really cool thing. And it actually reminded me of what what Stardot's been doing for the last few years with um, a lot of the old BBC um, and Acorn manuals. I know that last time I checked, they had something like about 15 or 16 of them that they'd remastered. So we're talking, um, obviously, master, um, a, lot of the, a lot of stuff to do with things like um, DFS, Econet, all these sorts of more obscure sorts of bits, as well as the general sort of manuals. Uh, in fact, um, here's t- show and tell time again. I've got another prop. In fact, I went and got myself the BBC Micro User's Guide reprinted. This is effectively a brand new BBC Micro User's Guide. As you can see, it's lovely and all that sort of stuff. So I actually got that printed up uh, probably about 12 months ago. Um, again, you know, massive shout out to the the people at Stardot for for actually making the making the remasters and all that sort of stuff. Um, for all intents and purposes, um, as you can probably tell, it, it basically functions like the original, um, although a lot of the bugs that were in it back in 1985 or whatever have finally been squashed. So this is arguably better than better than a, a, um, a vintage one. Um, this cost me about $45 Australian, uh, which is probably about 20, just over 20 quid, um, uh, you know, to get this all done, to get it delivered and to get it to me. Uh, and given that I'd be paying at least that, if not even more for, uh, for a, a, um, a vintage one that's, uh, it's probably going to be looking a bit manky. Uh, to me, it was a, it was a no brainer as, as far as I could tell. Yeah, for that price, I think um, what what Tony held up there for the listeners was what looks to be the original BBC Micro Manual. It looks original. It's got a glossy cover. It's got a, a lovely metal ring bind down the side. And uh, to hear that any errors or bugs have been squashed in the manual is just brilliant. So this isn't just a scan of the original manual. They've obviously um, either retyped it or used you know o- OCR to scan it in, uh, lay it out and make sure it's all perfect and then improve it. For just over twenty pounds, you're going to be paying more than twenty pounds for any um, 
modern computer book of that size. So for someone to be able to cater to such a niche for that price is absolutely brilliant. And hats off to them. And hats off as well to Stardot, because I know it's a brilliant uh, community and forum. I have been on there in the past to get help for myself um, and to look things up. Uh, like so many of these brilliant communities, I'm always a bit tentative to to register and start chatting on there because, before you know, the next week I'm working on a different system, and I don't like to look like I'm just mm. doing a hit and run on these communities to to get information from them and disappear. I just haven't got the time to commit to them. But um, if this whole YouTube dream ended tomorrow, and I was going to sign up to a community and settle myself down somewhere and uh, and be around um, really nice retro loving people then stardot would be high up on my list so um go and check them out if you've got any interest in bbc micros electrons uh, archimedes all of that stuff that's the place to go um and also seeing that nicely bound manual made me think i need a binding machine i, I mean i've mastered shrink wrapping anyone who's been watching my episodes shrink wrapping on my boxes now i need to start ring binding uh, <laughs> I think that needs to come next. But for anyone else who doesn't want to invest in a in a ring binder, um, that that looks like a good option, and I love that it exists. And um, I don't manuals are one of those things that uh, I don't mind too much if they're a bit beaten up. And I, don't, you know, the ones that I've got included with systems, they've often got signs that they've been loved. They've got notes in the columns from the previous owners. They've got um, workings out, people just trying to figure out. Sometimes they've got corrections where people have spotted the errors in the manuals. Yeah, but but for the sake of 45 US dollars, 20 quid, I, I think I would probably go with the, the new improved version, actually. I think, I think that's a really good option. So nice. And hopefully um, Duncan will put the links in the show notes if indeed those are still available to purchase or at the very least to the forums to go and find out more about them. Um, how about you, Chris? Yeah, it's it's tricky actually. I mean, if I was trying to complete a set and the machine was pristine, well, I'd want a pristine manual. But then, if it was a pristine machine, would I also want that manual to be original? Mm. So you sort of get into that if you're completing a set. Um, if, on the other hand, though, my machine has a reproduction case and maybe even a reproduction box, then of course the manual also being reproduction would be perfect. Um, I really like this. What I really like about it is the fact that he's also included easy options for printing, obviously, for your own high-quality prints. But more than that, the fact that this is an old manual, fully retyped and updated, as you guys have just expanded on, but also, hence, in its electronic form, fully searchable. So mm -hmm. to me, that's almost better than having a nice brand new looking one on the shelf. So anyway, please do check it out. Links are in the show notes as always. Our final story this week is a fun one from the depths of the internet that listener of has dug up and shared on our subreddit. It's the tale of a joystick that caused the Ministry of Defence to declare it a threat to national security. <laughs> Are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. This is the story of Simon Goodwin, who looked upon computers with mice as the fancy, expensive bits of kit they were in 1983. It was the domain of Park at Xerox Palo Alto, and not yet commonplace in the home. But Simon wanted to recreate a similar experience on the 8-bit micros we had available to us at the time. Why shouldn't a ZX Spectrum have a mouse? What he set about creating was actually more joystick than mouse, but he set out to create the desired effect at minimal cost and give people the experience and the feeling that they were using a high-end system and a mouse. He created a prototype of what was essentially a joystick with a mouse on top. And I'm not talking about a computer mouse on top of a joystick. I'm talking about a plastic top that um, is in the shape of a mouse. So almost like a mouse toy sat upon a joystick base. Uh, an interesting approach. I, I think you'll probably agree. Inside, there was nothing more than micro switches, just as you'd find in your competition pro joystick or whatever your joystick of choice was. And as you rocked the mouse from left to right, forward and back, it would register a press on those switches. When you think about it, it's quite unremarkable, to be honest. Uh, but things went up a notch, and this, this project did progress, um, notably when a £10,000 grant was awarded, which I now know is about US dollars if we just double that. Australian. <laughs> and, um, the project was called... Oh, sorry, Australian <laughs> dollars. <laughs> it's the accent Chris it throws me. Um, so <laughs> 10,000 10, British pounds, 20,000 Australian dollars, 
what that is in American, I don't know. Well, <laughs> we have to go and look it up. But um, what they called this project was the Digital Mouse. And it was developed to be commercially ready to sell and the uh, patents were filed. And that's where it all gets a little bit odd. Soon after patents were filed, a letter was received by Simon and his team from the British Ministry of Defence, which had intercepted the application and under the powers vested in them by Section 22 of the UK Parliament's Patents Act, denied the publication of the patents as it was prejudicial to the defence of the realm. This was officially a threat to national security. They were banned as a result of telling anyone about this, and they were threatened with two years in prison if they did. But this was nothing more than joystick with a plastic mouse on top of as I've explained. Were they really going to end up going to prison for that? So what they did next was not hide under the duvet and burn all of the prototypes and hope that it all went away. No, they made as much noise as they could about it. This, after all, could be marketing gold. So they hit the newspapers, the TVs, uh, anyone who would listen to call the bluff, to call out the Ministry of Defence, and the media lapped it up. Of course they did. They had nothing to lose. Uh, a pretty ballsy move, I think you'd agree, by Simon, who was just 21 years old at the time. Ultimately, however, they didn't raise the funding needed for the injection moulding and for the other work needed to complete production, and their patent lapsed in 1990. And what else came along in the meantime? Well, I've got sat next to me uh, exactly that. You may have seen him already. I call him Trevor, but you may know him as the Cheetah Tortoise. Essentially, a joystick base with a tortoise on the top and three buttons, and you and you rock him about, and you very quickly get repetitive strain injury. But uh, aside from being a different animal, it's exactly what Simon described in his patent. Uh, it was made for the 8-bit micros. It, it was aiming to achieve exactly the same thing, although they didn't specifically call it a digital mouse or aim to use it for mouse applications. It was more, uh, I guess you'd, you'd call it a novelty joystick rather than a digital mouse, but it, it had the same effect. So, um, yeah, while I don't feel too bad for him because the, the tortoise wasn't exactly a, a roaring success in terms of sales numbers. So I don't know how far his digital mouse would have got in making a return on his investment. I don't think he needs to feel too bad about missing out on that front. It does make for a really interesting story. And there's a lot more to it. The link will be in the show notes if you want to go and read the full story. So um, uh, Chris, having read this story, I know you've, you've read it. Do you think the digital mouse could have been a success if it wasn't delayed by the ministry and got out before Trevor? Well, I've not had the pleasure of touching Trevor yet, but I understand the concept. I think by the time the patent lapsed, the cheetah tortoise emerged from its shell and we were well into the mouse-driven GUIs by then, like Workbench on the Amiga and um, Tosser on the ST. No, sorry, Gem on the ST. And of course, those really needed a mouse. But we're talking about 1983 here. So yeah, I think this paired with the kind of device like, I don't know, a Sinclair Spectrum or maybe even the more business-like, you know, QL even, or even a BBC Micro and you know, not for gaming, but for menu navigation, I can actually see what they were thinking. Keep it in mind, if you look at the keyboards of those machines, you know, the BBC, the Electron, the Sinclairs that I've mentioned, the cursor key layout is, well, it's not really intuitive. Let's put it that way. I think the Amstrad CPC range got it right, but not many others did. Yeah, I noticed that even on the Apple IIe that I've been working on recently, the, the arrow keys are all in a line. They're not in the, the usual, well, we call it usual, the later cursor key configuration of up being the top one and down being the bottom one. They're just all in a line. And that's understandable because, you know, the desktop metaphor, wimps, GUIs, they, weren't, they just weren't a thing in the late 70s. And they weren't expected to be a thing on, on budget computers in the early 80s. So that's understandable. Um, but just thinking about the, um, the patent being shut down, I don't know how often they're shut down on the grounds of national security, but I guess that's because we, we wouldn't hear about them unless you go run into the press like Simon did. But it really doesn't sound like a wise move in any other circumstances than those where you no, this is just a joystick, this is ludicrous, so therefore I'm, I'm going to go all guns blazing to the press. I can't think there would be many circumstances where that would be a good idea otherwise. Um, similar stories, have you come across any, either home or abroad? Um, 
I, I only think I, I, I'm getting a bit confused because is it patents or is it patents? Um, I, I thought there was an H in there. Anyway, <laughs> um, anyway, Tony, it's both, Chris. It's, it's, it's both. both. Okay, it depends where in the world oh, you are. Patents. As as we discussed with a a recent commenter on our last show, I think in America it's um, it's patents. Ah, oh, that's what uh, he meant. Not it, not it, patents. It, 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 I was confused. <laughs> no, no okay. patents. Yeah, British English would be patents, but you know. Live and let live. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, any, any stories that you've heard of like this? Yeah, well, before I kick into that, I think it should be patently obvious that patent and patent can be pronounced in different ways around the world, but I digress. With, with Simon's story, I've got to say, that was, a, that was something of a wild ride because I, I read the whole thing. Uh, but that said, I, I, I think I understand where the Ministry of Defence was coming from because if you, if you read the story, um, the actual patent itself was filed under... Simon filed it under what was called a command signaling device. And, and that really, if you don't know what a computer is, that actually sounds quite sinister, especially during the Cold War. You know, there was still obviously a lot of nervousness around that sort of thing. And I suspect that, you know, this is 1983, so I suspect that whoever it was at the Ministry of Defence that, that became aware of this, of this uh, patent or patent uh, may not have even seen a computer in real life before. So it's possible that they, they couldn't comprehend what this was meant to be. So they just assumed the worst and decided that this was something that was going to be of uh, severe um, potential national security. So that's that, that, that's my read on the situation. Um, but I've got to say, at least this, this, this whole experience didn't put Simon off because reading further into the article, it looked like he had a lot to learn from that particular experience and he applied it in a whole bunch of his later work, um, some of his contributions, he was involved with the development of the Sam Coupe, um, which a lot of us know about being obviously kind of the, up until the, the ZX Spectrum Next was basically the mother of all speckies. Uh, and he was also involved with the CST Thor 16, which I'd never actually heard of until I'd read this story. And apparently that was a, a Sinclair QL compatible machine um, honestly, Neil, um, I reckon Simon, I reckon you should get him in for a retro tea break because I reckon he'd have some great stories to tell. Yeah, um, I totally agree. And um, I re I'm, I'm going to reach out to him and see if he wants to have a chat. And I'd love it if he's still got some original copies of those old letters that he can show us and any, any other correspondence and, and maybe some newspaper clippings. Hopefully he's got all that filed away somewhere and we can have a good chat. So I will, I will definitely take you up on that suggestion, Tony. Good idea. Thanks for that, Neil. Um, but yeah, back to the point regarding the use of civilian devices for potential military purposes. Um, I might be misremembering, but um, I have a vague recollection of, of one of the consoles, one of the Japanese consoles. I think it was around the turn of the century. So we're talking like Dreamcast or PS2 era um, that, that may have actually been used by the US, US government for some sort of military research. Have you guys, does that, does that sound familiar, Neil? Yeah, that, that's an example I would pick out that is perhaps comparable. And it, it's one that I fully bought into because I was in the market for buying a PlayStation 2 when they launched. And when I heard all this, oh, it's it's effectively a supercomputer. It's 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 a threat to national security because of how powerful it is. I was like, yeah, I want a piece of that games console. I want a console that, that, that that's so powerful it could threat na threaten nations. And I bought into it. And then I thought, looking back on it, when I got the PlayStation and... and, and <laughs> playstation 2 and saw what it could do and uh it's slightly shonky anti-aliasing and all the rest of it i'm not knocking it it, it took a while to get warmed up and for developers to make the most of it i thought yeah this isn't a threat to anyone's national security it was just marketing but actually there was some foundation to it um i've put a link in the show notes for duncan who can who can perhaps share with listeners as well to an old bbc news article about this in which it says that japan has imposed export controls on sony's highly popular playstation 2 games console on the grounds that its components could be used for military purposes it goes on to specifically say those purposes would be missile guidance systems so in that example i don't know if they mean pulling components out and using them perhaps the cpu perhaps the the gpu i'm not sure or if it was to use the system as a whole, and and um, it was used in that way. So uh, the PlayStation 2 and also the PlayStation 3 after it would be used to build supercomputer clusters uh, for the US Air Force Research Laboratory, for example. They built the 33rd most powerful supercomputer in the world in 2010 using only PlayStation 3s. So, you know, the, the threat could be there in the wrong hands. 
uh, to build a very cheap and very powerful supercomputer. So I can see why they put export controls, for example, on, I think, Iraq in particular. Um, we're not allowed PlayStation 2s during that period. I'm sure they had more important things to be doing than uh, playing video games. But if it could be used for nefarious purposes, then, then sure, um, I can understand that. But this is all we have to remember well beyond the patent stage. Nobody looked at a PlayStation 2 patent and said, yeah, that's a threat to national security. We're shutting it down. We can't have people you know, you know, playing games. It was only when it was built and they saw that, oh, actually, you can put a hard drive and Linux on this thing and you can cluster them and it can form a supercomputer. Okay, we shouldn't export them. But by that point, it had already been created. So slightly different. Uh, but somebody did. In contrast, look at a plastic mouse on top of a joystick base and say, that's a threat. However, having listened to Tony's argument, I, yeah, I understand exactly how that might have happened, uh, particularly in the terminology, as as, to, uh, as Tony identified, um, could well have, have just set off some red flashing lights down at the ministry. Uh, and eventually they did back down um, with the help of a little bit of media pressure and they got there in the end. If that was you... In the, the tiny chance that it might have been you working at the ministry who had that come across your desk and you put a big rejected stamp on it, then do get in touch. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. <laughs> it's time now for our community question of the week. So we're going to look at your top three answers from last week's question. Just to recap, the question was, if you were to try and justify your enthusiasm for retro games and you were to do that by presenting just one game to another person to play, which game would you pick and why? Any genre, any system? Which game would you use to demonstrate why these old games are just as much fun today as they were back then? Now, I've had an, I have an idea of what game might get a mention. Um, a game or two, in fact, that, that, that might be obvious candidates. But let's see what your opinions are. Um, starting with, if we uh, go to Tony, do you want to read out the, the most popular answer? Yeah, Richard. Um, Richard's comment. If I were to suggest just one game to grab someone's attention... I'd have to avoid such classics that drew me back to my humble Amiga. Titles like Dragon Master, Mercenary, Damocles are fantastic games, but they require some investment in time to enjoy properly. I'd therefore focus on OutRun. Um, no, wait, that was terrible on the Amiga. As a game that shows that simplicity can really draw you in <laughs> and get you hooked on just one more go, I'm going to pick Stunt Car Racer. From the mind that brought us subliminal games such as the Sentinel and Formula One Grand Prix, this game highlights the benefits of just being able to pick up a game and play without any prior knowledge and also rewards you for repeated playing. Truly one of the greats. Um, yeah, fair shout, Richard. Um, Jeff Crammond, um, absolute legend. Uh, my first exposure to one of his games was playing on revs on the BBC Micro when I was at school. Um, F1 GP, still in my top three favourite racing games of all time, on the Amiga, of course, um, got to do it properly. Uh, but yeah, it's um, that really, really good point, Richard. Yeah, uh, despite its simplicity compared to modern games, Stunt Car Racer still has that astounding ability to make you sick to the bottom of your stomach and give you vertigo as you come over some of those courses. So uh, it stood the test of time well. Uh, the second answer comes from Dave Velociraptor. He says uh, Monkey Island 2 would be his choice, LeChuck's Revenge, on the PC with, of course, a Roland MT32 for that uh, music and a nice CRT monitor, not the enhanced version, and it doesn't need to be a talky version, okay? He says the pixel art in the game is magical, the game is light and fun, the puzzles aren't too over the top, and there's help available if you need it. It's a wonderful experience, and I don't think it's dated at all. I cannot fault that answer one bit. Um, do I like the talkies over the non-talkies? I think I do. I think I would normally pick a talkie version if it's available, just because I remember how exciting they were when it came out and 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 what a step change, a uh, sea change it felt to to have voice acting over your games, uh, over your adventure games. So I would go with the talkie version, but I've got no argument with you whatsoever over the choice of game. I think that's a great choice. Nice. And uh, final answer from Paul, a.k.a. Hermski, who says, I would say Pong. This is where it all started, the birth of electronic gaming in the home. Pong quickly expanded its physics to Space Invaders and Breakout, garnished versions of Pong. Breakout, yeah, obviously a garnished version of Pong when you think about it, but I would, I, 
never seen Space Invaders in that light. So that's quite interesting. But I think he's right. My answer for this, like I said last week, I didn't have an instant answer, but having some time to think about it, I would say Pac-Man. So anything from that area where it was just the simplicity of the game with the, you know, there's no need to explain what you needed to do. You just jumped in, you played the game, and you were instantly rewarded, and that's what drove you to get better and better. If you want to suck somebody into retro games, those kind of games is what would do it, I think. Yeah, what do you guys think? Yeah, I think so. Um, And yeah, of course, Pong in the home was the big one. Um, Fun fact for you, the first ever video game, so I'm not talking about um, oscilloscopes or any other kind of weird way of hooking up a game to work on an early prototype. Uh, it was a game of drafts or checkers uh, by British teacher and physicist Christopher Strachey, and he made it for the Ferranti, yeah, Ferranti Mark I computer. I'm, I'm, if I'm stuttering, it's because I'm reading this here because I had to just double check my facts. Mm. Um, Ferranti Mark I computer, the game pitted a human operator against the computer, with the game board and the positions shown on one of the Ferranti Mark I Williams tube displays. And it was first played in July 1952. Mm -hmm. So there you go, 70 70 years of video, actual video gaming. Um, Yeah, just just a fun fact, (laughs) relevant to very little else we've been talking about, but uh, it was just the thought of Pong being the first big one in the home. I just thought I'd throw that out there. So those are our top three answers this week. And it leads us leads us on to our community question of the week for this week. So this week's community question of the of the week, based on uh, some of the confessions of Tony and the guys that he worked with in a bank that will remain nameless. But what IT related pranks did you play back in the day? Did you create a fake virus? Did you swap keyboards around? Um, maybe hidden folders on a system filling up the hard drive? Tell us how you got one over on your fellow students or maybe your family and friends or maybe it was even your work buddies. Did you get away with it? Did you get caught? Let us know. Excellent. Yes, let us all know about your pranks. Um, We've got a week off next week, so you've got a bit of extra time to submit your answers to uh, reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro. And uh, I'd like to end the show by saying a big thank you to Tony for joining us from Oz Retro Comp. There'll be a link to his YouTube channel in the show notes. Go and check him out. Give him a give him a sub. And uh, thank you so much for your for your time and for joining us today, Tony. It's been an absolute pleasure, Neil. Oh, look, thank, thanks again for inviting me, Chris. Thanks, Neil. I've, I've had an absolute ball. Thank, thank you again. And um, yeah, just yeah, um, keep being retro. See you later. This Week in Retro was presented by Neil Thomas from RMC The Cave and Chris Winter from 005 Agima. It was produced by me, Duncan Styles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favourite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash thisweekinretro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.